Okay, everybody, uh, you are uh, in the session with um, talking about a couple projects that uh, have received uh, help from state resources. And we have a couple presentations that um, will talk about that. Uh, my name is Wayne Jurdy. I'm the Recycling Market Development Coordinator for the state of Minnesota. I've been doing this uh, 27 years and um, have a long and varied background, which if you want to go see that, you can go read the bio. Um, and uh, our speakers, our first speakers here are uh, Joanne uh, Birkenkamp. And Joanne is the Managing Director for MBOLD. It's a coalition of Minnesota-based food and agricultural companies, uh, umbrella under the uh, chamber. And um, it's, it's really a great organization. I, I have to say that uh, my dealings with them have been just unbelievably uh, good. So, and then the other speaker, um, well, let me get down to that. Oops, is Andrew Peterson, Peterson. Uh, and um, Andrew uh, started his career in London, spent it, uh, most of his uh, time working for an energy giant BP, which has been around for a long time. Uh, and then now he is uh, uh, the CEO of MyPlast USA, and they are building a plant in, in Minnesota, and they're going to talk about that, um, uh, that plant. So with that, um, Joanne and Andrew, uh, take it away. Great. Excellent. Um, as Wayne mentioned, I'm Joanne Birkenkamp. I'm the managing director of a coalition of food and ag companies that are based uh, here in Minnesota that are working together on big food and agriculture challenges, um, particularly climate and sustainability issues. Um, and one of the things that we are very much focused on is working on creating a circular economy for flexible films in the circularity space. Um, and so let me just share my screen and we're gonna share a few slides with you. Um, let me get rid of the chat. All right, can we see that? Yes. Good, okay. So we wanted to talk with you today about our efforts to create the circular economy for flexible films. So uh, Embold, as I mentioned, is this coalition that includes a lot of the big food and ag companies that are based here actually in Minnesota. And you can see here, pardon me, um, that group, including General Mills, we're actually co-chaired by the CEO of General Mills, Cargill, Target, Land O'Lakes, Ecolab, Schwann's Foods, um, and a variety of others. And Embold is a little bit different than various um, other coalitions that are out there in the food and agriculture space, because we do have this C-suite CEO level engagement from our members, and that opens a lot of doors. And I can tell you, as it relates to our work in flexible film, it has made a lot of things possible. So as Embold has thought about how we would tackle this challenge around creating a circular economy, if you look at this image on the right, uh, one of the things that we found in our region in the upper Midwest was that we did not have a flexible film recycler operating at scale within about 700 miles. And so to the degree that things like pallet wrap and tote liners and single use shopping bags and that kind of thing, are getting recycled, they're going a very, very long way. Um, and there wasn't really an opportunity then to use that recycled resin and make it into new products like other film to really try to do film to film recycling. And so as we looked at our ecosystem, we knew we really needed to think about how can we attract a very sophisticated uh, film recycler to put a plant in the upper, mid in upper Midwest region so that we would have that kind of geographically appropriate um, recycling ability for film. And then we knew we needed to address this question of, so once you have that recycled resin, where does it go and how do we create the demand for that resin so that it can be made and like upcycled into new products. And so we were very fortunate um, at Embold to find MyPlast, uh, which is a South African film recycler. Um, you'll hear, hear from my colleague, Andrew, here in a moment. Um, and we have been working with them to locate a plant here in Minnesota. Um, and one of the ways that that came about is that four of our Embold members 
General Mills, Schwann's uh, Target, and Ecolab, along with Charter Next Generation, which is a film manufacturer, jointly made a $9.2 million equity investment in MyPlast to start their operations in the United States through a plant in Minnesota. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it now to um, Andrew to tell you a little bit about that plant and uh, my class's operations to start up here in 2023. Thanks, Joanne. Hello everyone. Uh, Andrew Peterson, as Wayne said, I am the CEO of my class, uh, USA. Maybe just a little bit about the company. Joanne mentioned we are based out of Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, we are a end-to-end -end recycler. So depending on who you speak to, recycling means different things to different people. Uh, we do it all, sorting, grinding, um, extrusion, uh, washing, pelletizing. Um, we've been in operations for 10 years and we are very happy to locate our plant, our first plant in the USA, uh, in Rogers, Minnesota, which is about 25 miles northwest of uh, downtown Minneapolis. Uh, the plant at full scale will produce uh, or pr uh, process about 90 million pounds per year of plastic waste uh, and will employ about 20, two, 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 250 people. Um, so that's just a little bit about, about the site. It, you know, clearly, we are, we've done a lot of work to get to where we are. I really like this chart. I've uh, shown it uh, quite a few times to people. It really summarizes what we've done to date and, and kind of the model that we've established. We haven't started operations yet. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do to get the site up and running, but we have taken occupation of, of the site uh, up in Rogers. We are starting the build out. Uh, we've got, got uh, equipment underway. Uh, I've recruited for, for my leadership team. So things are going you know, full speed ahead um, in, in Minneapolis. I'm currently in Cape Town. Uh, working with the team here um, to prepare for for startup and uh, finalize our you know, technical plans, but I am based in uh, in, in Minneapolis. Uh, I maybe just want to talk then also about the the second piece, so not not the um, you know, the other side of the circle uh, chart next. Uh, part of what makes this model that we've created, and we're going to show you a video, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, is the fact that you know even before startup we have uh, found ourselves a partner and and uh, Joanne can talk about this a little bit um, also but we found ourselves a partner not just through investment but through uh, an offtake agreement um, to really kind of set up the business for success as we start up so not just you know setting up a recycling plant but setting up a a, a full value chain and we found that through through Chart Next Generation, who is a um, a converter, as we call them. So, well, you, this audience should, <laughs> probably knows this, um, but you know, taking the resin that we that we sell and uh, and uh, converting it into into film products. And uh, before I pause, maybe a question on many people's minds. Usually, when I talk about our business and, and our plans here for for, for the US, um, how did it recycler in Cape Town, end up in Rogers, Minnesota. Um, my place has really spent all of its, uh, its, its free cash flow over the last 10 years to really invest in our processes and um, the quality of our products. And that really shows in, in the customer base that we've built over time. And so we were lucky enough, fortunate enough to find Embold. Embold found us, serendipity, fate, so we, you know, whatever you want to mm -hmm call it um but uh yeah that's where we are today and very much looking forward to kind of bricks and mortar and getting it getting it up and running right thanks andrew so this is the general model that we have and the thing that i think is uh, you know a bit unique about what emerald is trying to do is it really is about bringing together the end users of these film products so depicted at the bottom of this graphic on the right bringing those CPGs mainly um, and folks like Cargill and, and Target and others together to really as the users and generators of film waste and the users of film products to help fuel this cycle of driving plastic uh, film waste into MyPlast once that plan is operational, then Charter Next will buy the bulk, 
by the bulk of that film, the resin rather from my class. And then our members and others will help drive the demand for that PCR, which is obviously a really critical piece in that whole equation, right? And for recyclers to make the investment in expanding the infrastructure for something like film recycling, the, the demand piece is really critical. And so our model has been based on trying to pull together both that supply and demand through this uh, sort of like multi-layer uh, corporate engagement. So where we are now is the Embold members um, are working collaboratively to drive the demand for the PCR um, and looking into providing that supply to MyPlast. Um, and our next big move is that we are going to be um, start inviting other major users of flexible films in the upper Midwest to join us. So we're doing that in December and we're trying to take a very kind of, you know, big tent approach um, to get this work to scale. So we look forward to others joining us. Um, and then before we show the video, we wanted to talk a little bit about how the state of Minnesota has played a really integral role in this project. So. Wayne, you know, thank you for the kind words. I have to say you and your colleagues, Susan Heffern and others have been so helpful um, to Embold. We started working on this project. We identified this idea of a circular economy for flexible films uh, in the upper Midwest. We identified that a week before COVID hit in March of 2020. We brought together all the packaging experts from, you know, General Mills and Schwanz and uh, Land O'Lakes and others um, and started thinking about, so how are we going to do this? And um, Wayne's shop has been just tremendously helpful in sharing advice with us, having been down this path. You know, Wayne and his team have worked in this space for a long time. Um, a lot of advice, a lot of lessons learned, um, and also a lot of market insights around where the challenges, where the opportunities, what's been tried, what's worked, where the, you know, the barriers been. Um, as well as a lot of data on kind of the state of the market. And one example I would share on that is um, MPCA has developed very uh, deep uh, data sets on things like agricultural plastics. So, you know, hay bale wrap and grain bags and all sorts of things that land on farms, um, which are all often quite difficult for farms to dispose of properly. So that's an area that we're looking at. Um, and that kind of market data from MPCA has been very helpful to under, for us in understanding kind of the scope of the opportunity. Um, and then lastly, you know, contacts with the MRFs in our community to plastic uh, converters to end users um, have just been tremendously helpful. And then Wayne, I would last say, you know, like the moral support has been tremendous because, you know, what we're trying to do is complicated, right? Um, and I know many people around the country are kind of thinking about how they can take something on like this. And so having that moral support from MPCA, um, I will just say personally, has been very helpful to us, and we are grateful for it. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Andrew to talk a little bit about um, the Department of Employment and Economic Development, and then also ask Christina if she can get ready to queue up the video, and then we'll do that next after Andrew speaks. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I think we maybe just to backtrack a little bit, we as um, as my place were kind of exploring where to go to in in the US. There's clearly a massive opportunity. Again, you'll see it in, in the video. Um, and we were kind of targeting the Midwest for, you know, mostly because of lack of capacity. You know, there's lots of capacity in the on the coastal regions, west coast, east coast, south, very little um capacity in, in the Midwest. And we really found a fantastic partner in, in Minnesota, not just through Embold and, and Greater MSP, but also through through Deed. Um, the you know through working through any type of government, um, I want to say very carefully use the word bureaucracy, but working through government bureaucracy can be um, painful at times but just the level of cooperation from you know site selection to support to kind of holding hands with with um, whoever need needed you know some 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 hand holding with uh deed was there all the way and uh you know we ended up with a i think the slide there said 1.45 million dollars of of uh, grants and and uh and um, and loans, most of it being grants. Fantastic. I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say that uh, hot off the press over the last 
a week or so, we have received another grant of $350,000 for uh, training, which brings the total you know, up to nearly $2 million of grants received from, from DEED. But again, and as we go through the video and talk about the partnership and the um, collaboration, uh, it, it wasn't just about the money, it was really about the support and the visibility and just the intent of the state of Minnesota and particular uh, DEED to really, really make this project happening. And, 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 it's, and it's happening to, to, to this day. Um, I, I am having conversations with DEED daily around uh, you know, getting those grants um, ready to go, getting the money into our bank accounts so that we can set up the site, uh, get, get the build out done. And they are doing things that they haven't done before because they believe in this project. And that's been almost as valuable <laughs> um, as, as, as the actual money. Excellent. You know, the other thing I would flag before we um, show the video, and Christina, thank you for, for getting that queued up, um, is Embold is actually part of an organization called Greater MSP. It's the Greater Minneapolis St. Paul Economic Development Partnership. Um, and they the, that entity has been critical to our work also because the business investment team there was really instrumental in helping find the Rogers uh, site for the MyPlast facility and also coordinating with DEED. And so it has taken a lot of different players playing different roles to carry all this off because it was an equity deal. It's a uh, uh, logistics and uh, real estate deal. It's the offtake agreement with Charter Next. It's the engagement of all the Embold members um, who you're going to hear from here in a second to make this kind of thing possible. So Christina, can you, um, can you queue up the video? We'll do that. All right. I am going to be taking the spotlight away first. Okay, now I will share my screen. All right, I'm going to try that one more time. You almost had it. I, I needed to hit share sound. Ah. Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna do that. Okay. Now let's see if this works. Did you know we use 12 to 15 billion pounds of flexible packaging and film every year in the United States? Products such as food packaging, shopping bags, shrink wrap, hay bale wrap, construction materials, healthcare products, boat wrap, and pallet wrap. Flexible films are everywhere, but in the U.S., only 5% of these packaging materials and films get recycled. The rest of these fossil fuel-based materials are used once and then take a one-way trip to the landfill, incinerator, or worse, into the environment. To help change that reality, we need to build circular economies where flexible films are recycled on a regional basis and made into new products, reducing waste and cutting greenhouse gas emissions. As co-chair of the Embold Coalition, I'm excited to collaborate with other companies headquartered here in Minnesota and across the value chain to drive the creation of a circular economy for flexible films in the upper Midwest. This circular economy initiative shows what is possible when we face a challenge together and collaborate to find creative solutions. Through the Embold Coalition, an initiative of Greater MSP, we've created a groundbreaking collaboration to advance a multi-state circular economy for flexible film centered in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region. Lead investors General Mills, Schwann's company, and Charter Next Generation, and supporting investors Target and Ecolab are making a joint $9.2 million equity investment in MyPlast USA to establish a new mechanical polyethylene recycling plant in Minnesota, MyPlast's first location in the U.S. Also supporting development of this new plant are the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, Closed Loop Partners, and the state of Minnesota. In turn, Charter Next will purchase recycled resin from MyPlast to make new film products for the food, healthcare, and industrial markets. Additional Embold members will explore opportunities to direct film waste for recycling and or evaluate product applications for recycled resin with Charter Next. Reducing the environmental impact of our packaging plastic film is a core commitment for Schwann's company. That's why we're part of this important investment in MyPlus USA 
to launch a state-of-the-art film recycling plant right here in Minnesota. The Midwest currently has little capacity to recycle flexible films. Through MyPlus USA's new facility, we will help drive a new regional circular economy, giving Midwest film users new opportunities to have their material recycled close to home and increase the supply of recycled resin. Our new state-of-the-art 170,000 square foot flexible films recycling plant in Minnesota is slated to begin operations in spring of 2023. As a leading producer of sustainable films, Charter Next Generation will expand our portfolio of films using recycled content. CNG will purchase recycled resin from MyPlast to broaden our sustainable film portfolio. We're also a leading provider of sustainable films that enable brands to meet their commitments for recyclability and recycle content. Collaborating across the value chain is key for tackling complex challenges like catalyzing a circular economy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and cutting waste. Building a circular economy for flexible films in the upper Midwest, it's one more way that Minnesota is driving innovation and the economy of the future. Right. It's a very important part of New York. And Let me get this off. Okay, Joanne, we're at 18. Okay, yeah. great. So let me just come down to our final slide here. Mm -hmm. um, get this from the current slide. Just to say um, that this really has been about collaboration and it really is about finding ways to create value across the value chain and a shared vision. Um, so we really have found the collaborative piece with the business community is key. You know, I don't think Minnesota would be having this new film recycler locate here without that kind of um, corporate engagement to say, we really wanna make this thing happen for that equity investment for the agreement to be looking at how to provide film supply into my class and to drive demand. So as I mentioned, uh, the next step, and I'll wrap up and we can maybe do a little Q and A, Wayne, is just to say, as I mentioned, we're starting to invite other corporations that have a film footprint um, particularly here in Minnesota within Embold's or within my class's film shed to join us. And we're excited about that. So stay tuned. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at things like boat wrap. You know, we're here in the, the land of 10,000 lakes. We've got a lot of boats. Um, it's a lot of, you know, low density polyethylene film, which is the material that we're caring about. So we'll be talking um, with that community to check out oppor opportunities with boat wrap. Um, as well as agricultural plastics and, you know, potentially county hazardous waste sites that might be interested in doing more. Um, and the last thing I will say is, you know, we're focused both on things like pallet wrap and shopping bags, which are obviously non-food grade, but my class will also have a line focused on HDPE milk jugs, food grade material to help um, expand the supply of food grade recycled resin. So that's part of the equation. And as you can imagine, for our members that are food manufacturers um, like General Mills and Schwann's, um, that food grade resin and expanding that supply, that material is a high priority for us. So with that, Wayne, let me hand it back okay. to you. Yeah, so uh, thank you. And uh, let me just say, having done this for 27 years and uh, had a few successes, but mostly failure in the uh, flexible film, this is the second uh, uh, place in the country, maybe third, uh, if you include Hilux, but from a major uh, pound uh, standpoint, this will put Minnesota on the map and also put film recycling on the map. So uh, with that, there's a question uh, says, how did you go about applying for 2 million in grant support from the state of Minnesota? And either one, you can answer that. Andrew? Patience, Wayne. Um, no, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> no. I, I mean, these things take time, right? It's, 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 it really is. Uh, you know, the state's got some really good incentives. So I would say it's about understanding the requirements, um, making the right connections within deed, and just having patience with the process. Um, it took it took a while, but this entire project took some time. I think Joanne mentioned we started in, in March 2020. Um, you could probably take it even a bit 
a bit further back when we started our conversations with Deed, not not long after that, I remember a conversation, uh, a, a lunch in, um, in in St. Paul that we had. And since then, you know, we, we went through the motions. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's, you know, offer a good project, um, be very clear about the requirements. And, you know, the, the, the funding is there. The, the, the state's, you know, uh, very keen on, uh, it's got a very good economic development department. So um, it's not as hard as you might think. Okay, uh, next question is how many tons will your facility process? I think we went through that before. At full capacity, at least the initial target is 90 million pounds. Obviously, after you reach that, hopefully you'll continue on to uh, KW capacity, which is 600 million pounds, I believe, at the moment. Um, next question, what kind of... Uh, would this kind of investment sync up with EPR? And I'm not sure if they're talking about um, uh, mandatory recycling of, of film or something to that effect, but you guys can answer that. Yeah, I would just say briefly on, on that point, you know, uh, we don't have that legislation yet here in Minnesota, but we know other states are pursuing it and doing it. Um, and so I think there's just a recognition that that is coming. Um, and with our companies, you know, they're selling all over the United States and ha often have production facilities all over the United States. So, you know, our folks, our companies are really focused on how do we do it better with these plastics and LDPE, this, you know, flexible film is, is tough, right? So and it was one of those things that really drove us to collaborate creating this kind of an ecosystem is not something, you know, even with our, our Embolds members, even as big as those companies are, they can't do that by themselves. And so it was a space where we really need to collaborate um, and hopefully take some initiative to kind of get ahead of the curve on some of these issues. Um, yeah. You know, consumers don't like the plastics, the companies want to innovate, um, and it's time to really figure out how to do this and take it to scale. Okay, one last question. Yeah. What partnerships will you engage to promote collections and produce feedstock? And I'm assuming it's feedstock to for you to process. Yeah, so we have uh, we have tried to identify without having a lot of hard data who we believe the other big generators of film waste to be in our region, and we are inviting them to come together here over the next month or two. Um, and here, are what we're up to, we'll invite them to join us um, in Embold Circular Economy Initiative, and to get into conversation about how they can participate in supplying film and driving that demand, and also providing you know strategic advice and support to this work, because um, it's going to take a village, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we're very committed to that, and we're excited. You know, I mean, yeah. as you can imagine, like the whole equity deal, it took a long time to work that out. It was there were lots of lawyers. It was very behind the scenes, and then we went public in May. And now we're like moving that next step to really open it up to lots of other folks who would be interested in participating. Well, to end that, so let me just say uh, projects, when I first started this, uh, this job, it took about five years to bring a project to, to fruition. This one's taken about three years, which I think is relatively fast. And, mm -hmm. and uh, let me just say, uh, I was in there at the beginning, stepped out, kind of came in when I needed to, but really, uh, uh, this was a great partnership where this was easy for me. Uh, you guys <laughs> did all the hard work. So anyway. All right. Uh, with that, we will go to our next presentation. And um, this is Pure Cycle. Uh, Tansen uh, uh, Etifa, I think I pronounced that right. Uh, Chief Sustainability and uh, Chief Commercial Officer for Pure Cycle. Uh, technologies a little it's kind of interesting Tanzan's been around in this business longer than I have however we really never met until about five years ago which is kind of weird we saw each other at conferences but we just never talked to each other so um, she has 34 years of experience in recycling plastics uh, and implementing recycling collection programs uh, she has been with uh, Pure Cycle for I don't know, uh, Tansy, you can tell me four or five years and um, <laughs> is working currently to build multiple plants and multiple collection systems um, in multiple states. So, and maybe someday Minnesota. So uh, with that, Tansen, take it away. Sure, let me share my screen and get this thing up and going. All right, 
Wayne, can you guys see my presentation? Just yes. want to make it sure. Absolutely. Right. Sometimes I can be technically challenged. It comes with my age. So thank you for having me. Um, Wayne did a good job of uh, introducing who I am for some reason or another, though I can't progress the slides. So let's see what's going on there. That's not good. Oh, there we go. All right. So, um, so here's a picture of me nine years ago. <laughs> I got to update my photo. As you guys can see, I don't quite look as um, young in the photo, but I have been with Pure Cycle since February, so not quite two years yet. Um, I like to give my first hat, which is the environmental hat, and why we're here is we're all really trying to work col collaboratively together to get the 17 goals to transform our world, right? We've got climate goals um, out there, but beyond that, there's 17 goals the UN has put out forth. And when I look at our industry, 12 of those goals, our industry can impact in the recycling. And of course, everybody on this call personally can impact all 17. And so if you haven't ever gone and looked at the UN's goals uh, to, to transform our world to be more sustainable, I highly encourage you to do so. But when I look at why plastics recycling's become really a great impetus of trying to get it recycled, it kind of, in my mind, started in 2010. Even though I've been in it since 1988, 2010 was kind of that moment in time where I read the World Economic Forum um, report called Vision 2050. And that really sparked my attention as well as many CPGs that we've got to do something in that report, it basically states that by 2030, we're going to be using 2.3 times what the earth can produce. And that's not sustainable, right? So we've had a lot of companies come out with commitments back then in 2010. It's kind of funny when you look at the report, it says by 2020, we're going to be running out of time and it's really going to be a race to 2030. And when I think about 2020, we've really been moving the needle much faster, much quicker than we did the first 10 years. And quite frankly, I call this the teenage years. It's awkward, it's expensive, and that's what teenagers are. And we're running out of time and we've got to move quickly. There was also Jan and Jambeck's article on the plastics in the ocean, and it's what's really made a lot of people hate plastics. Um, I myself hated the plastics uh, in my 20s. I thought, you know, as a young mom, I was throwing away more plastic than anything else. But if we look at what we're consuming too much of, it's carbon. Carbon affects climate change. And if we're going to get to a point where we're consuming more carbon than the earth produces, we're going to be in a big world of hurt. People think about plastics as being carbon. It does come from carbon, but it consumes less carbon to make plastic packaging than other packaging materials out there. And that's why we've seen such a big transition to plastic materials. And I think we all need to do a better job of, look, it's not going away. Banning ourselves out of this isn't going to fix the problem. We've got to come up with solutions. So solutions like MPLAS and MBOLD, who's going to help support a circular economy around a plastics recycling facility. Um, then we start to jump forward. We need innovation. We need technologies. We've heard this buzzword about advanced plastics recycling technologies, and there's been chemical recycling out there for years. It's kind of a, a rebrand of words. Unfortunately, Pure Cycle used the word advanced recycling technology because it is not chemical recycling. Now, I'll get to that in a minute, but it is a new innovation and a new technology that's coming into the market. Uh, but before I get there, the other thing that kind of came out of that as I left my slide up there and you could hear about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the plastics economy, that produced packs. Plastics packs throughout the world have erupted. And in 2020, the US plastics pack erupted. And in it, they formed targets. And in those targets, the first thing they needed to do is define unnecessary or pragmatic plastic packaging. And so when we think about the difficulty around recycling plastics, there's a lot of items that don't have critical mass to warrant the investment in recycling it, or they actually have a negative effect if it makes its way into a recycling stream of another type of plastic. So they identified those, they put the list out, I'll have that on my next slide. They want to have 100% of their plastic packaging to be either recyclable 
or reusable or compostable. And they also have ambitious tasks to have all of their plastic packaging uh, recycled by at least 50% by 2025. And then they also want to incorporate recycled content or compostable content or bioresin content. So in 2021, and it just came out at the beginning of this year where we really heard about items like PETG not being necessary, polystyrene not being necessary, PVC not being necessary, and then specific packages like stirs and straws and things like that. And so that's really moving the needle. A lot of companies have now taken the impetus to go out and switch the type of materials that they're using in their packaging to be more recyclable packaging. So the one material that's been close to being thought of unnecessary because the recycling rate's so low, so I kind of wrote down that 5% recycling rate of film, polypropylene kind of falls in that same kind of genre of only being recycled at about 5%. But it's the number one resin used in the world. It outbeats that polyethylene number. In the US alone, there's 17 billion pounds of polypropylene being consumed. And the pro problem with that is when you kind of look at the opportunities on polypropylene, you wonder why is PET recycled? Why is HDP recycled in such a big way? Procter and Gamble developed this technology, and when they looked at PET, there was a large volume of PET that comes in the natural form. So whenever we think about PET, we think about water bottles and soda pop bottles, and even the green Sprite bottle Coca-Cola just recently made clear so that it has much bigger opportunities to go into end markets instead of just the scoop that Procter & Gamble was making out of green PET. They now have clear PET in a greater volume by switching the Sprite bottle into a clear bottle to go into other colored PET products. When we looked at HDP, Procter & Gamble, they make Tide bottles and uh, Pantene shampoo bottles and things like that. So they needed something that they could color in that fluorescent orange. And so there was plenty of natural available. But when they looked at the products they make in polypropylene, like deodorant sticks and razor blade handles and toothbrushes, the pie of natural polypropylene is very, very small. I think my communications people did a poor job because I see a lot of natural in the picture of the polypropylene below. But if I move forward to the next slide, there's so many different formats that polypropylene is used in from automotive. It represents about 60% of the car is polypropylene. When you think about furniture, <clears throat> a lot of people I know in uh, Envision, where I was one of the founders of Envision, we used to get parts of toys and parts of broken furniture in the bales of high density bottles that we're recycling. And quite frankly, a lot of that was polypropylene. Um, the medical uh, supplies like our surgical masks that helped us through COVID are made out of polypropylene. So that's a flexible format. Chip bags are flexible formats of polypropylene. And then we have things like carpet, which is a fiber made out of polypropylene. And then you've got your yogurt cups and Quite frankly, today, most of the fast food chains have moved to a polypropylene cut because polystyrene has been considered unnecessary packaging. So they've moved to polypropylene. But we really haven't had an industry that could recycle it beyond Wayne mentioned KW Plastics, who's at 600 million pounds a year capacity. Half of that's polypropylene, half of it's polyethylene. But they recycle car batteries, which are black, so they can put that material back into a car battery case. And they also do the paint pails that you now buy that used to be steel or polypropylene, but they're black. So when you take all those formats and mix it together, you go into black, but there's limited end uses in black. KW really grew their business by capturing the type of end markets that can take it in black and being part of those end markets. But when we look at, again, Procter & Gamble, who needed razor handles and toothbrushes and deodorant sticks, and those come in bright and colorful branded colors, they really wanted a natural polypropylene. So the solution was doing solvent recycling. And solvent recycling is a way to dissolve polypropylene, not changing the monomer, not changing the polymer of polypropylene, leaving it in a polypropylene format. So when you think about in layman's terms, what's the number one solvent in the world today? It's water. Water dissolves what? It can dissolve salt, for example. 
So think of the polypropylene as being the salt and the solvent being water. Water dissolves salt. If you accidentally contaminated your salt with pepper, you could sort that out by dissolving the salt with water and then filtering off the pepper. We're basically doing that type of technology with polypropylene. We're dissolving it with a solvent and we're filtering off the things that aren't polypropylene like the colorant, the additives like uh, calcium carbonate that might be added to the polymer for stiffness. We remove that. If somebody adds polyethylene to the polymer to make it more flexible, we remove that. And what we end up is with that crystal clear polypropylene pellet like you see on the right versus in the past, companies like KW who make a gray or a black pellet. Um, when we first got started, we built a pilot plant so that we could prove to customers with samples. It's not a laboratory line, but literally a pilot plant that could make production to sample people. And we built that in 2019. It took us a few months to get the kinks out and debug it, but we've ran over a hundred different formats of material, including dirty diapers. And I'm not encouraging that we want to recycle dirty diapers. We only got about a 35% yield out of it. But the fact that the technology could clean it up and remove the adsorbent in the diaper, remove the polyethylene components of the diaper and leave just a pure polypropylene afterwards is amazing. We've also made commitments to go out and build a billion pounds of capacity because if we want to be the solution to all the packaging companies that have made commitments to use 30%, 25%, even 50% like Pepsi by dates like 2025 and 2030, we had to get a growth from a 5% recycling rate up to at least at the very least a 30% recycling rate, which means we need well over a billion pounds. So with that, we've got the announcement that came out two weeks ago with our JV, with SK Global, which is a huge manufacturer of polypropylene is going to use our technology along with the creator, Procter & Gamble, and we're going to cooperatively Pure Cycle and SK Global build a plant. We're about to announce the site selection for our plant in Europe. We have multiple plants for pre-processing materials because quite frankly, at curbside today, not many MRFs take polypropylene in. But we have a lot of wish cyclers out there that are putting things like McDonald cups and yogurt containers and uh, sour cream tubs and butter tubs that might be made out of polypropylene into the recycling bin because they see the recycling chasing arrows and a lot of people still perceive that as it's recyclable. So we see a lot of polypropylene go to uh, curbside collection systems. In fact, we see about 900 million pounds a year of polypropylene making it into the bin, but we're only recycling about 400 million out of that because the MRFs aren't equipped to sort it. So Pure Cycle built a sortation facility that we're having a really difficult time opening up and getting an occupancy uh, permit because a lot of people assume we're a chemical recycler that we're gonna have emissions as opposed to being a solvent washer of polypropylene. And we're doing that solvent wash in Ironton, Ohio. And I know in this group where we're talking about incentives to operate, we actually got about a $750,000 grant from the state of Ohio. So that was our incentive to take a building that was already in existence and refabricate, refabricate it to meet our needs. And um, so we've gone in and put in a pre-processing facility next door to our purification plant in Ironton, Ohio. And so we thank the state of Ohio to help us make it so that we could put pre-processing. We, we're actually gonna be commercial in the next 60 to 90 days. And if we didn't have pre-processing, then the economics of purification wouldn't be there. So I mentioned we could do a dirty diaper, but our yield loss was huge. The same thing happens with curbside. If the plants, the MRFs aren't sorting for polypropylene, and currently today, they're probably landfilling most of the three through sevens, we wanted to have the ability to go in and take the plastic residue off of a MRF and mine the polypropylene out of it and expand the capability of MRFs recycling polypropylene. And so we had uh, ambitions to first do it in Florida where there's a lot of waste to energy plant where those three through sevens are going. But again, we have yet to be able to get an occupancy permit because we have a lot of environmental groups who are saying we're akin to burning, which we don't do. 
and that we're going to put microplastics in the water, which we're not going to do in our process. So anyway, these are some pictures of our pre-processing in iron tin. And um, we're pretty much at the very end part. All 26 modulars for the purification are in place. We're waiting on a final extruder to enter our plant, and then we're going to turn the lights on and start running commercially. So we're really literally just 60 to, to 90 days away from being commercial, and we can't wait to have that happen. Um, this is an internal of the building that we got the $750,000 to repurpose it. It was rusted. It had holes in it, leaks everywhere. And we, we redesigned uh, the plant to be a more open atmosphere so that we could put pre-processing in there. And so what you're seeing in this picture is a series of agglomeration lines that can take things like uh, surgical gowns, uh, masks, flexible film for chip bags and things like that, carpet and raffia and feed bags from agricultural industries. We're working with a major store chain right now for them to take back the uh, pet and agricultural feed uh, bags back into their plant. We're working with other organizations to do like dog food bags are made out of polypropylene, but it's a woven polypropylene material and it's got to be agglomerated into uh, better than a fluffy material so that we can get capacity and throughput in our purification line. So the pre-processing helps us feed our purification with volume and mass to make the economics work. Um, so how do we do the purification before just, I said, dissolving it? We do a series of processes. We do melting and filtering on our first uh, phase. Then we do extraction. So we melt the polypropylene into a liquid form. We filter it in case there are some materials, dirts and organics and things like that. And then it goes into an extraction process. The extraction is literally where we dissolve it and then we mix it and then we settle out the things that are, have heavier densities like PET, like polystyrene, polycarbonate, things like that, that hopefully we get out in that process because we missed it in the pre-processing process with float sink tanks and things like that. And then we purify it. We remove the odors and the colorants and um, some of the additives. We even remove things like antioxidant and anti-slip and anti-step that the Virgin Resin companies put in there. And that's why we call our process purification. We're really making a pure polypropylene out of this. And then we extrude it and pelletize it. So this is kind of the landscape of different feedstocks, film, fiber, mixed rigids going into that extraction. And in that extraction, we remove the odor and the oligomers, and then we mix and settle it, and we remove the solids like calcium carbonate and some of the heavy colorants in the polyethylene, and then we filter out the remaining pigments and colors and the small particulates. And then we actually recover the solvent. So there's been a lot of talk that we're using this expensive, high chemical solvent, and that's just not true. The solvent that we have is very volatile, and it can be in a gas form or a liquid form. So when we apply it to the polypropylene, it's in a liquid form. And then when we change the temperature, we can gas off and it leaves the residue of the contaminants that floated throughout the solvent. And then we just use that solvent over and over and over again throughout the course of the year. Um, so what is it that PureCycle is looking to purchase? We're looking for curbside polypropylene where uh, MERS are separating it. Okay, thank you. And curbside mixed materials where they aren't sorting it because we put this pre-processing in and hopefully we'll be able to open up the doors in our Florida plant where we have higher capacity so we can take more of the one through sevens, three through sevens, and two through sevens. We're taking, like I mentioned, raffia, super sacks, bale wrap, feed bags. We're taking pill vials from some of the pharmacies that have chosen to recycle the um, pill vials that are brought back to them. BOPP, are uh, that is the film that your chip bags and things like that, labels that go on to uh, packaging can often be made out of polypropylene. And when they make the labels, they have to cut out the shape of the label and they have all the trim waste on that. Predominantly what we're going after is post-consumer, but there is some post-industrial material. And then people might've heard about our program that's pure zero, 
where we're going into football stadiums, basketball stadiums, baseball stadiums, sporting events at universities, and quite frankly, conferences like the National Plastics Recycling Conference last year, we recycled that with our Pure Zero program. And all we asked them to do in exchange was stop making different drink cup formats and let's just stick to one polymer, making it economical. So you're gonna to start to see some of these events go to a mono material. So the economics for recycling at these events become more fruitful. So uh, mono materials is something that you're gonna hear a lot uh, sit in terms uh, going forward. So one of the takeaway is what is our purification not? It's not waste to energy. We don't burn the material. We don't convert it to fuel. We're not chemical recycling and we don't use a mass balance approach to say, oh, we're gonna take all the pounds in and put it into all these different products and you just can count it towards plastics recycling. A pound of polypropylene coming in equals a pound of polypropylene going out. We know what we're putting into the system and what we come out is the 100% recycled content. And so uh, we're just like a mechanical recycler that has the next generation of technology added to the end of it. So we do mechanical recycling in the front end to get it clean enough so that when we do the solvent wash, we're getting the most capacity out of it. We're not changing the monomer. I mean, we're not changing it to the molecular level of a monomer, which is what is the definition of chemical recycling. And quite frankly, mechanical recyclers, purification, and chemical recyclers all use chemicals in their process. Chemicals are used every day. So when you're a mechanical recycler, you're using things like caustic and surfactant to wash the plastic. We're not calling mechanical recyclers chemical recyclers, so we shouldn't call pure cycles process. Jansen, if you could wrap it up. Uh... Okay. Our carbon footprint is less than virgin by 35%, and this is a fully baked, and it's less energy by 79%. Again, we're going to have co-products to sell from our process. Unlike other mechanical recyclers, we're hoping to sort the PET and the HDP and rebail it and sell it to other recyclers. These are some of the formats that product has already been made out of our product from our pilot plant. And then this is just me preaching that the three R's weren't good enough and that we had to have responsibility by the producers redesigned for recyclability. We still have to reduce and remove all unnecessary packaging. We have to reward consumers by making recycling easier. And if we don't get it done with my 10 R's, there's gonna be regulations. And again, we're inserted in between mechanical and chemical as a new technology that has better energy than chemical consumption, but not as good as mechanical. So mechanical is still number one on carbon footprint. But if you're a packaging company like P&G and you need a colorful product and you need to be able to put a product in it with recycled content purification is the solution. Okay, and thank you, Tansen. You're and so that, welcome. <laughs> um, um, just one question. Uh, you are, you're operating building plants in multiple states. Have you received other grants in those other states and assistance from those other states to build your plants? No, we have not, and we haven't asked for it. Okay. Um, we went public, so we were able to receive investor money through consumers. And okay. we've taken that money so far and used that and applied it. Doesn't mean we should look uh, a gift horse in the mouth. And so as we're building out and getting the financing for our Augusta, Georgia plant, it's quite possible that we'll look to see what we can do to make it more economical. And, and that might be permitting help or, or uh, things like- uh, Sure, could use some that help on that so, on the government yes, side because yes. my goodness, I've, I've never had it where we pass zoning and everything else. And then after we're permitted, it gets pulled because a group of environmentalists said that we're akin to burning. So yes. it's frustrating and I get it. I was one of those angry people myself about plastics and you know, it's not going away and banning isn't the solution. We've got to come up with economical low carbon footprint solutions. And we also have to be mindful there are bad manufacturers of all kinds out there and recyclers. And we have to be a good steward and do a good job of keeping the community safe and the air clean and the water palatable, right? Okay, great. And um, if you have questions that you didn't uh, get answered, um, 
you can you can see uh, Tanzan's uh, email there. Um, and I believe there are ways through the uh, uh, speaker, there is contact information. Uh, Tanson, thank you for agreeing to speak. And Andrew and Joanne, um, this, this is just a uh, <laughs> tip of the iceberg. There is a lot of material out there. And so we need you know, 20 plants like Tanzan's and 20 plants like my plants out there. And we'll uh, uh, make a dent uh, uh, in it. Uh, but I will say both of you, um, when I started doing this 27 years ago, it was startup after startup. And um, we had about a 50% failure rate. So uh, it's refreshing to work with companies that are funded, have connections and, uh, are actually doing things. So with that, I think that's the end of our session. I would just and say my phone number is incorrect as I'm looking at it for the first <laughs> time. It's 4767, not 4667. And people think I'm risky putting my cell phone up there, but I really want to be engaging and be able to answer people's questions. So please guys, don't hesitate. Well, Tans, you're a boomer. We, we talk on the phone. We don't email as much, right? No, we are in text. So you can see that's the wrong text number. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess there's a five-minute break, um, and there's a, uh, additional great presentations. And with that, I think we'll, we'll end this session. Thank you, guys.